Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Peter Tire from Business Review, and I'll be your host today. It is our pleasure to have with us LTS AG, who is presenting us on the topic titled Transdermal Patches, Dearest Skin Concept for the In Vitro and In Vivo Translation Using New Prediction Tools. Now, today's guest speakers of us will be Dr. Marco M. Gimbrich, who is the Corporate Vice President of Head and Pharmaceutical Development at the LTS AG. We also have with us Dr. May Pidden, who is the Director for U.S. Business Development. Now, I'd like to welcome everyone here to On24. You notice that this platform is browser-based, so if you do disconnect for any reason whatsoever, please click on the link that you receive via email to rejoin the session. In order to ask questions, you could tighten them in using the questions widget as the box at the top right hand corner of your screen, submit your question and click submit. We'll then allocate some time at the end of the session to address any thoughts or questions that you may have. Please also use the yellow help widget in case you need any assistance to move, resize and maximize any of the screens in front of you to help get a better view of today's session with LTS AG. But for now, please allow me to hand you over to our first speaker of the day. Dr. May, over to you. Thank you, Peter, and good day, everyone. So a little bit about LTS, the company. LTS is the transdermal market leader and leading global partner of the pharmaceutical industry in transdermal therapeutic systems and oral thin films. We have a global presence for our partners with two main sites. Our site our headquarters is in Andernach, Germany, roughly one hour from Frankfurt Airport. This is a manufacturing site as well as our global center for research and development of all of our technology. A site in West Caldwell, New Jersey is focused on commercial manufacturing for the U.S. market. The two sites have identical manufacturing lines to offer redundancy and flexibility, and both are approved by the major regulatory agencies. We also have a site in Shanghai for our business dealings in Asia. LTS has over 1,100 employees worldwide and over 290 million euro last year in revenue. Of that revenue, we've reinvest over 20 million euro back into the organization to further develop our technologies, capabilities, and market positions. We have over 300 patent families and last year, over 800 million units were manufactured between the two sites. So our coding capacities mm -hmm. are quite large compared to the industry. Currently, we have over 30 projects and products in our pipeline, and our total manufacturing space is roughly 60,000 square meters or 200,000 square feet. LTS is a CDMO and technology company with our core technologies grounded and based in coding technology from which we are able to derive two distinct dosage forms. Oral thin films, or OTF, which are very thin polymer films that are taken orally and release their active substances via the mucosa in the mouth, and transdermal therapeutic systems, or TTS, which are applied to the skin and act systemically or topically. We are also developing microarray patches, or MAPs, which have tiny needles that penetrate into the uppermost dermal layer, dissolve and release their active substances. <laughs> Our business models consist of collaboration projects wherein the partner selects the API and the technology, whether TTS, OTS, or MAP, and LTS acts as a full service provider, reimbursed by the partner for R&D activities and manufacturing. LTS also forms partnerships for our proprietary projects where LTS selects the API, indication, and technology, performs predictive screening, funds R&D and initial clinical activities, and now licenses these candidates to partners for further development. And with that, I turn it over to Marco to describe more about our transdermal patches and our LTS tools for transdermal API candidate evaluation. Yeah, thank you, May. And also from my side, a very warm welcome to our today's webinar, and uh, thanks for joining today. And uh, I would like to start uh, with a short introduction onto transdermal patches and how they actually work and how they function. So as you can see here, it's a scheme of um, a cross-section of the outer skin layers, where a transdermal patch is applied on the outer surface, 
especially saying on the stratum corneum, which is the outer barrier layer of uh, the human skin. And in order to pass through um, with the drug to the skin layer, one has to fulfill a number of prerequisites in order to the pharmacokinetic function principles um, to occur. Everybody knows the lab principle, liberation, absorption, distribution, and metabolism, as well as elimination. And before this uh, principle can apply, the two additional prerequisites have to be fulfilled. First of all, a patch has to adhere to the skin, and that's over the whole application time of either one day or seven days. The second prerequisite is occlusion, because the occlusivity is important to entrap the moisture in the outer skin layer. And this, uh, this additional moisture is really important for this, the skin flux, and it can be as, as minimal as a factor of three to five, where the flux is increased by this occlusivity. And once this is occurred and applied, that's the key prerequisite before starting the development of transdermal patches and um, before, yeah, actually the function can occur. When we're looking at the global market, there's a whole number of patch designs being developed and commercialized over the last decades. And here you see an overview of examples of patch designs and patch formulations which have made it there. And um, let me briefly go through and explain you slightly the differences. The easiest um, formulation type is a monolithic matrix, pa matrix patch, where the, everything is done in the same matrix, and I will get to that in the next slide. We can also have multi-layer matrix patches where the separation of the drug loading and the skin adhering layer is uh, being used. Additionally to those matrix patches, we can also introduce a rate controlling membrane, in this case, to achieve a very constant kinetic control drug release through the membrane. This can be done either by the solid matrix TTS, but also by for example, gel type mat reservoir matrix patches. These reservoir patches used to be um, state of the art in the very early days of transdermal development. In the meanwhile, these products has, have more or less disappeared from the market. A more modern uh, type of patch design and formulation are micro reservoir matrix patches, where there's a separation of the adhesive and the drug containing inner compartment. And I will get to that in a few slides in a bit more details how these work. Some more special designs have also been made to the commercialization. One is a matrix patch with an overlapping backing layer. One of the key drivers in developing such a product was the need of a very good adhesion over multiple days, like three to seven days, for example, as well as a very expensive drug compartment here in the inner, sphere, in the inner area, which is used in a square, in a square mode in order to avoid any, any waste during the manufacturing. Other formulations also have been developed in order to accommodate the needs for volatile drug substances, like in this case, where the API is embedded between different layers. So now let's, let's come to the uh, examples of patch formulations. And let's start with the most common patch design in the market, which is this monolithic patch, AKA drug and adhesive. In this case, the adhesive layer here has is, is formulated between the backing layer and the release liner. And the release liner is removed before application of the patch, and the backing layer is then protecting the adhesive layer during the application time. In this case, the adhesive has to fulfill three different roles. First of all, of course, ensure the adhes adhesion to the human skin. But secondly, also the API and other excipients have to be dissolved within the matrix and have to be constantly released during the application time. If needed, yeah, this design can, as shown before, have been expanded to multi-layers where we can separate the drug solubilizing component of the adhesive matrix with the skin adhering mode. The adhesives used in this type of formulation, they have to come along with good solubility properties, either for the API, but also for other function excipients and film forming components. Most commonly used here are acrylic pressure sensitive adhesives, uh, which fulfill these different prerequisites. A more modern type of patch design is a micro reservoir system. Here uh, in this scheme, we separate the adhesive part from the inner compartment, the inner droplets. And I will explain in the next slide exactly how the function works. This formulation type is used to maximize 
the API utilization to get a, an optimal drug release, but also if you want to increase the drug flux profile in order to enable a relatively small or reasonably small patch design, which cannot be occurred by the standard drug and adhesive formulations. Uh, materials used here, uh, adhesive used in this kind of micro reservoir patches are very hydrophobic adhesives like silicone based materials or other similar components. And if we dive a bit deeper into the micro reservoir formulations, here we see um, a cross section of a schematic section of a micro reservoir with the backing film, the removable release liner, and in the center, the matrix. And the matrix contains this polymer containing uh, uh, spheres, which are API solutions, either in liquid form or in a, in a solid dispersion, for example. And here as an example where this is a liquid, these are liquid micro reservoirs, and once applied to the skin, this solubilizer or the solvents used right in here, these droplets, are usually also selected to be very good permeable to the skin. Once they diffuse into the skin, uh, we create within these droplets is super saturation of the API. And based on that thermodynamic activation, the drug diffusion occurs, and we get a really good drug flux with a reasonable short lag time. So this is really a key advantage of this formulation, fast onset and a really good drug use. And basically, um, these formulations can run empty or more than 90% drug utilization at least, um, if you don't remove the patch before. Overall, at this stage, I would like to show you some advantages of transdermal patch um, from patient perspective. Uh, it's a, it's a non-invasive dosage form, which is easy, discreet, and convenient to use. And it's effective, and especially being very well approved by patients, because you can see while you're wearing the patch that it actually works. In the next chapter, I will also come to a few advantages, for example, like fewer side effects. and we can address patients which have difficulties to swallowing, especially with multi-medications. Patches are very well known also for multi-day use or long application intervals, mostly common in that area of three to seven days. And transdermal systems are very well accepted in the treatment of children, but especially in elderly patients and those patients which are requiring complex medical care by, by caregiver, and they like to apply the patch on a routine basis. And with that, I will hand over to Peter, and we go for our next first poll question. Thank you very much, Dr. Marco. So, ladies and gentlemen, the first poll question of the day is, do you or does your company have any experience in transdermal or topical drug delivery? If yes, with which kind of products? So you can answer either yes in terms of transdermal or topical patches, yes, topical creams, gels or ointments, Yes, micro needle patches. Yes, several of the previous answers or no. So, Dr. Marco, um, what prompted you to ask this question whilst the audience are answering? Of course, we are interested whether our audience is consisting of a lot of experts or whether we have yeah. the opportunity also to um, address some people which are new in that field and, and maybe they can learn something from our today's webinar. So, uh, usually sure. in, in transform webinars, we have a lot of experts sitting. No problem. That's fine. I understand. All right. Well, let's see how the results are for this first poll question. So as you can see, the first choice, transdermal or topical patches, is most common. Before the second one will be the yes, several of the answers. Um, any input to that, Dr. Marco? As expected, we have a pretty, pretty experienced audience. And uh, yeah, I hope that I can, yeah. Tell something new for them today. No problem. That's fine. Well, over back to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So within our next chapter, I would like to talk about the pharmacological advantages of transdermal patches and how these can benefit patients or also caregivers. And at the end of the day, also these advantages are a key driver for commercial success of a transdermal patch product. So on this slide, we have an overview about the advantages which have been uh, achieved within commercial transdermal patch products. Uh, one example is we can reduce the drug exposure, like for example, in hormone patches. We can address a short half-life of an API and compensate this with a 
controlled release manner. You can reduce side effects, and I will show a few examples on these in, in a few slides. You can overcome low oral bioavailability by going to the transdermal route. It's also that the transdermal patch allows an infusion-like drug release, like a pain medication. And also what's quite important and pretty easy to achieve is a simple dose adjustment by the patch size. And a few of these examples within the next slides. And I would like to start with the our first example, which is the API oxybutynin, which is used in the indication of an overactive bladder syndrome. The key side effect of this API is most dryness caused by the river metabolite and desethyl oxybutynin. As, as you can see here in the figure on the bottom right, for the immediate release dosage form, this metabolite is uh, occurring in a pretty significant plasma concentration. And by going to the transdermal application, this metabolite could, could be reduced significantly. And therefore, as shown in the clinical studies, also these side effects like dry mouth or also constipation were on the placebo level for the transdermal patch. So a key advantage of um, the circumvention of the first pass effect by a patch. But then the second example is also about some reducing side effects, but in this case, simply by circumventing the gastrointestinal passage. The example here is the API rivastigmine used in the indication of Alzheimer's disease. And before the transdermal patch was on the market, um, already the capsule form was available, and the commonly observed side effect here was nausea and vomiting. And these side effects caused a lot of patients to discontinue the treatment. By moving to the transdermal route, in a clinical trial, it could be shown that uh, at three times less gastrointestinal adverse events have been occurred compared to the capsule. So the TTS treatment was very well tolerated and with the reduction, reduced fluctuation in drug plasma level. Furthermore, the development of central mediated cholinergic side effects could have been attenuated. So this is the reason why the Exxon patch was really a good commercial success and the whole market basically was flipping and was turned over to the transdermal application, whereas the capsule only remained as a small portion of this. Now, the next example is, um, as I shown before, um, the infusion like of drug release. So a lot of drugs have a very narrow therapeutic window, and uh, we want to overcome as well also side effects by a certain high peak to trough ratio. The example here is the use of opioids like buprenorphine and fentanyl, which um, use in, in multi-day applications from three to seven days. And it allows a pretty constant drug release over this time. And in the meanwhile, these pain medications are standard of care also on a global, on a global basis. But also for a 24-hour patch, in steady state, we achieve a pretty constant drug release, which is like infusion type. But in our last example, I would briefly touch the uh, API reticotine, which uh, is, was developed in the indications for Parkinson's disease and restless leg syndrome. In the case of reticotine, this is the first and only new chemical entity which was de developed only as a transdermal system. The reason for that is that the API itself has really low or insufficient oral bioavailability. Therefore, it was not druggable at all by going for a standard tablet or capsule formulation, for example. Uh, this patch was developed as a micro-reservoir patch formulation, which allowed a reasonable size of the product. It comes also, and this is another advantage, in three different strengths, so meaning three different sizes, to deliver it between one and eight milligrams within 24 hours. So summarizing the pharmacological advantages, which allows a product to be differentiated in the market uh, with benefits for the patient. We can achieve constant plasma levels and overcome peak trough fluctuations. Idea for APIs with a narrow therapeutic window. We achieve PKs which are similar to interviews venous infusions. And of course, the drug is released in a controlled manner. And at any time, the patch can be removed for example, if a treatment would like to be discontinued by the patient. We can circumvent the first pass effect, uh, which, since we're not passing through the GI tract. We can compensate short drug half-lives. And as shown before, different patch sizes allow different dosages with the same product behind. 
And next part, very briefly in two slides, I would like to touch the manufacturing, but not go into much details for today's webinar. The manufacturing of a transdermal patch is pretty unique compared to other pharmaceutical dosage forms like, like tablets, capsules, or also parenterates. We are differentiating the manufacturing with, within four different unit operations, starting with the API pre, um, and mass preparation, uh, where we do this in this kind of stainless steel vessels. We dissolve API, for example, in an adhesive solution. And then the next step, we bring them to the coating lines. This is an example of a, of a coating hat where we dry the thin layers of adhesives on a substrate. It's dried and also laminated to the backing, for example. And the next step, we take these wide rolls and we go into a slitting step where we've already predetermined the width of um, and, and, and the patch by the, the slitting into the reasonable size narrow rolls, which are then transferred to a conversion step where these patches are punched out and individually packaged in single and pouched in single sachets. If you want to have a deeper look into the manufacturing of patches, please go to our webpage and there you can find a 360 degree video of our manufacturing sites here at LTS in Germany. So, and by that, we have a second poll question, and I hand over to Peter. Thank you. So, the second poll question, ladies and gentlemen, is, is there an API within your company's portfolio that you will potentially consider for transdermal or topical delivery by a patch? You could either answer yes, no, I don't know, or you never thought about that. Dr. Marco, um, what's your motivation for the second poll question? Of course, we want to want to learn whether our audience is thinking the same way as we do, and, want, and is also considering certain drug substances to be delivered by a transdermal route, and whether there's already mm -hmm. some new activities going on in the market. We'll see where this is going. And um, sure, sure, great. All right. Well, let's see what the audience says in this case. Well, mm, well, there's quite an equal trend between both yes and no in this case. What would you be your response to that in this case? I mean, for those, yes, of course, we would be interested to learn about that. But it's a pretty, pretty, uh, I would say, even distribution, as you said. And um, mm -hmm. okay. there's interest, of course, everybody knows to reach us. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now let's go into the, the most important chapter for today's webinar about the use of simulation tools, which we developed internally for in vitro to in vivo translation, including two case studies where we're using these tools within development of a transdermal patch. So these simulation tools or these two concepts are, we call them TRACE, um, abbreviation for transdermal API candidate evaluation. And this consists out of two different software packages, and I would like to give you a short introduction on these tools. The first of all, the first step we're doing in, in the trace uh, in software, we're using a database system with all sorts of in silico data, which we created based on the physical chemical properties. You can find them in literature of all different APIs, but also you can measure them yourself simply on the drug substance level. So this has nothing to do with any patch formulation. So this database is created based on more than 35 years experience here within the company and it was validated with all the commercial products out there, but also with, with those products which never made it to the market and which didn't show a reasonable uh, transdermal permeability. So we have different or uh, uh, measures of, of this trace scoring. And within the next example, I will go into a bit more details how this has been done. So first step, the trace scoring. And once we get a positive result out of this scoring, we can go to the development. And within the next chapter of the development, we will use our second tool to go uh, from the in vitro work we're going to do into a prediction of in vivo plasma levels. And this is what we do with trace IVM, so the in vivo modeling. So we simulate plasma profiles, and for that we're using all sorts of physical chemical properties, PK and PD data we can find in literature, but also a certain set of experimental data, and also we can include literature-based PK data into that software. So within our two case studies I will show to you today, 
I would like to explain you how we use the trace and the trace IVM to de-risk the development uh, projects and when we, especially in the translation from the in vitro to the in vivo stage. The first example is the API Asinipin and the considerations how to use the, the tools by approaching um, this development from lab scale to the first clinical trial. Um, to the API Asinipin, it's used in the indication of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia in adults. And when we then do in the first step the trace scoring, this is a more uh, larger picture of the result of that. We are putting all sorts of parameters we can identify for the API. For example, like molecular weight, melting point, PKA, log P, and a lot of other uh, parameters as well. We can, we can score them in a region between less favorable and favorable, and there's a certain function and algorithm behind how we balance these different parameters. And we're ending up with a total score. You can see this like a traffic light. It was really red, and we say it's not patchable within a reasonable patch size. If it's someone around zero, it's challenging, but might be tried. And if it's pretty green, like in this case, we have a really positive trace score, which is then triggering or supporting a decision to start with the prototype formulation development. Um, yeah, really uh, to do an actual lab work. And that's what we did with Asenapin when we moved into the prototype screening, formulation screening, and this is mostly done with uh, permeation studies using a fun cell type of a setup. In this case here, we have a donor compartment of the transdermal patch, human skin tissue in between or animal skin, for example, and an acceptor compartment beneath. The, in the uh, figure you see right here, uh, we're using uh, permeation data. We're using mini pig skin. Mini pig is, uh, a Europe, in this case, a European breed called Göttingen mini pig, which is mainly used in pharmaceutical development. And we're using that skin model to have a really constant quality for these kind of studies. So we set a target flux range, which we want to achieve at least with our prototype formulation. And as you can see, for within the application time of 70 hours, 72 hours, we achieved a drug flux of delivered micrograms per square centimeters an hour um, in this higher range. So we can, we can pick a number of prototype formulations to go into the next development step. In this case, what we have done in the next step is we go to an animal study. And in, as you see here, it's also uh, a mini pig. So the same breed, the same skin, basically, as we used in our in vitro work. Um, the the um, aim to do this preclinical st animal studies is to, to identify the tolerability of the API or of the patch components. And also, if there's any skin irritation being detectable, I can, I can see some redness here in this picture. So um, as an example, and we also measure pharmacokinetic properties um, and to see whether we can achieve the right plasma concentration with these prototypes or not. So together, tolerability and also PK profile is then the basis for selecting the right formulation and going to the next step. Before we do that, we confirm the right clinical candidates, um, because based on positive in vitro data, pos positive animal data, we can select these clinical candidates. We do this based on these in vitro studies using human skin tissue. And these are the right results here of this permeation profile within 72 hours. But now, before we go actually into a clinical trial, we can do a um, simulation, an in vivo modeling of the plasma profiles. So we are using our in vitro data set, which we have created before, and we do an acidic modeling to get to this plasma profile. This is simply model data for a multiple application of the patches. So in this case, you see four application, full application periods, and the measured blood level or the uh, simulated blood level in nanograms per minute. So for the first application time, we are ending up in a region between two and almost three nanograms per mil. And for the multiple applications, we are somewhere in the range between three and four nanograms per minute. Keep that in mind when we go to the next slides um, on, on the simulated ranges where we would like to be. And the next step, we actually go to a clinical trial and we are applying two test formulations over three and a half days. As you can see here, the red and the green curve. 
and uh, we're measuring the mean plasma profile compared to the reference product, which is a sublingual tablet, which was applied twice within this clinical trial. And we can see here that we achieved plasma levels of the transdermal applications between 1.8 and 3 nanograms per milliliter, which is pretty close to that what we have simulated before for the first application. And when we take this data set and actually go, go to the next step, where we do a PK modeling, a standard PK modeling, based on the plasma profiles which we have measured in the clinical trial. And so this modeling you can see is a, is a multiple applications of um, the oral reference product, but as well of the transdermal patch uh, here, as you can see. And we're ending up in the, the first simulation based on the data, of course, in the same region, depending on the formulation, also around two to three nanograms. But also within the multiple application and steady state, we're getting into the region of three to four nanograms, which we have seen before in the simulation. So it's pretty good fit of the simulated data with the plasma profile we, we uh, see achieve in the clinic. So based on the trace IVM, it's a pretty good simulation. And this simulation, uh, at the end, um, we, we took the, the result out of it that we can, based on the simulation, can support decision to actually run the clinical trial. Within our second case study, I would like to explain to you how we can use the TRACE IVM to de-risk development of a generic or a next generation TTS development. And in this case, in this example, we're talking about a multi-day hormone patch. And here is always the big general project risk. How can we translate the in vitro data with a certain lack of IV, IVC, so in vitro to in vivo correlation, and really make a good decision when we go into the clinical trial? The advantage here within this de-risking strategy, when we use the, our trace IVM, we can directly compare the reference product with any next generation or generic prototypes. And I would like to go to, to, with you step by step, which kind of data we create and what is used to do this comparison. So in the first step, when we develop a generic formulation, or one of the first steps is we're looking at the dissolution profile um, and the, the drug release in this case within 24 hours. And here we compare the blue curve, the reference listed drug, compared to um, a generic formulation. The, the drug release is done within 24 hours and, and until it's completely released. Then we take those data and we are putting them into our software and we're fitting those curves. And by that, we can determine the diffusion coefficients of the API within the patch. And we see pretty comparable results of this diffusion coefficient when we compare these two formulations. In the next step, we again run the solution, uh, sorry, uh, permeation studies using front cell type skin permeation, but using skin, human skin model here as a, as, a, yeah, as a barrier function. We are running the study over seven days. And we also, again, in blue, see the reference listed drug. And the pretty constant uh, generic formulation you see here, it's a bit more constant over the last uh, four days compared to the RLD. So slight differences in the formulation can here be identified. So usually formulation screening is done with this concept until we have a pretty equivalent product. In this case, it's not 100%, but pretty close. So again, we do a fitting of these curves within our software. And we're doing that by that, determining two different coefficients. One is the diffusion coefficient in the deeper skin layer, and second is the permeation coefficients in the outer stratum corneum of the skin. And the results show that in deeper skin layers is really, really identical, So, which is expected because the patch formulation is not making any difference of the diffusion within the deeper skin layers. In the outer skin layer, it's already pretty equivalent, only with slight differences, which, for example, could be uh, reasoned by different um, enhancer concentrations. So these are the in vitro data sets we're using and we're feeding within our software. And also, as, as in another parameter, we add in clinical data, which we can find in literature. And this is an example of a clinical profile over, over application time of this uh, hormone patch. And we're also fitting those curves within our software to get all the data out of it. 
So let's eliminate the actual clinical data, keep the fitting. And for comparison now, we add into this profile here, a plasma profile simulation of the RD based on our NVITO data set. We see already a slight difference between our NVITO and in vivo, but already for this kind of simulations, pretty close and very, very great with, as we think. And we add now the data based on our uh, in vitro data set for the generic patch formulation. We see it's pretty close to the blue curve. So the clinical data fitting comparable RD is within the possible approximation and the data set we're using here, which can also be different in the clinical setting, is pretty, pretty close. But especially when we compare the profiles between the reference listed drug and the generic formulation in green, uh, they are quite equivalent uh, within a reasonable uh, error here. And it's a good simulation to show that we can support decisions to be made whether we go to another BE, stu or BE study with these prototypes or not. So we have now seen two different applications of our trace IVM tools to justify uh, and to go in further, further steps within developments or not. And this has all been done without, let's say, wasting, wasting a lot of money in clinical trials and not achieving great data. So let me summarize the advantages and highlight the advantages of the TRACE tool and as it's used in the de-risking concepts of transdermal delivery projects. We can do this especially at a very early stage with promising API candidates to see whether they're even patchable or not. The TRACE scoring is done on a harmonized tool with predefined physical chemical as well as PK and PD parameters. This Benchmarking we can create out of this is really standardized. Before having this trace scoring, you can ask five different scientists and get six different answers whether a drug substances can be applied transdermally or not. We can also visualize knockout criteria because in case it really doesn't make sense for a drug substance to be um, developed as a transdermal patch, this software immediately highlights this as a knockout and we are definitely not proceeding in any any prototype development. The second component of our trace tools is the in silico evaluation and the uh, simulation of the in vitro to in vivo correlations. So the actual modeling of plasma profiles by using all sorts of in vitro data and before we then actually go into a clinical trial. You can also base the selection of the prototype selection on, on this IV IVC comparison on this trace tool. So, but once you have a reasonably working prototype and a successful clinical data, you still do not have a product which is on the commercial market. And from that, LTS offers a whole range of services by going into the development and to commercial supply. So we have a R&D center within Germany where we have more than 100 people working on all sorts of development projects from early stage feasibility to scale up and commercialization projects. But as well also we're doing check transfers. To LTS. We have a strong engineering department with more than 80 people, but we also can do machine design and machine engineering in-house, and a large number of our equipment was built by LTS themselves to accommodate and tailor them to the different product needs. We have about 50 square feet of R&D lab and, and office space, including our map team for the micro area patches. LTS can offer global regulatory and quality compliance and we can offer a global supply from our two sites as seen before the introduction. We have more than 10 coding lines, lines on the different sites and some of them are even product dedicated due to some special technical requirements. And we have over on the two sites more than 50 different conversion lines. So overall, we have a production capacity of approximately 2 billion transdermal patches and all thin films single packaged. And by that, I would like to thank you for your attention today to our webinar. And May and I, we are happy to answer all sorts of questions now after that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Marco and Dr. May. And just a quick reminder to the audience, um, for you to ask questions, you can type them into the box at the top right-hand corner of your screen and click Submit. But for now, um, the first question comes from some from the audience asking, do you need to remove the patch or do you have a dissolvable patch that 
it easily is removed after certain times. And that's addressed to Dr. Marco. So the, the patches are not dissolving. So the normal products as we develop them is an intact matrix which adheres to the skin. And at the end of the application time, um, they are removed from the skin mm -hmm. and the new patch applied at a different position. That's a standard application. So not like a, a cream or gel or some other dosage forms which are basically applied topically and they basically disappear over the time and you can you can wash them away. So a patch is really has to remove like a bandage, more or less. Sure, thank you for that. So another person asks, is the tool to guide to, to, to choose the API for transdermal patch also applicable for microneedle molecules? Um, that's not the case yet. So these tools we're offering here today or presenting here today are solely for passive transdermal or a topical delivery. We can use them for topical patches, transdermal patches. So we also, if you want to see whether it acts locally and we can achieve any permeability at all, we can also do this with these trace tools. But for micro needle patches, since you're penetrating the outer skin layer, uh, and you are basically achieving an intradermal injection, this is not the case. Because here we're talking about passive diffusion parameters, diffusion coefficients, and that's not the case yet. So I think our micro array patch team colleagues would be happy to give you some insights on the, the drugability within micro needles, because there are other parameters and prerequisites being need to full, be fulfilled in order to be applicable or not example like those or other things and not nothing with which we're doing here in the trace tool yeah, sure thank you very much for that dr marco another person asks so when selecting adhesive for your products what critical what's critical to quality attributes are you focusing on um that's a good question and uh first of all uh when you look at the global market, especially there's one product category, which are the fentanyl patches, where you basically can, you can find all adhesives in the market. So they're all generic to each other. So very often, um, it's it's a formulator's uh, uh, handwriting, as so to say. It's a, it's a fingerprint of those who are developing the product. But very often, you're also looking for certain um, prerequisites in terms of drug diffusion properties, drug solubilization properties, Pricing is also important, especially when you're looking at generic uh, competition. Uh, also, excipient costs are key drivers. Um, for those products I've, I've showed you, um, I think skin adhesion and, and drug diffusion was key driver to select this, uh, these adhesives. And uh, it, not, it doesn't necessarily mean yet that you can develop the product only with one adhesive. There are always different pathways to, to get the, the same re or similar result. But... Um, so it's 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 over the time certain products and certain adhesives really appear to be the best choice also from patient perspective at the end. Sure. And just to also add on, another person asks: Does the solvent system of the adhesive impact the drug solubility? <laughs> at the at the end of the day. Mm, the, the API has to be soluble in the matrix and not just in a soluble it comes with. So it could be, but it's, uh, I would, without talking too many, um, too many details or confidential information, I would say maybe, but not, not as a key component. So the adhesive itself is a key, as the key provider for the solubilization. Sure. Great. So one person asks, how many molecules are not currently delivered transdermally does your trace system give a positive result? That's a good question, and uh, you would be surprised how many. I'm not, I'm not, uh, actually, I can't tell you the, the exact number. Um, and very, very often, even though it's a positive technical uh, evaluation, for other reasons, it doesn't make sense. So there's no really medical need or there are other reasons why you should not do it, uh, or whether the oral dosage forms are already pretty pretty good and show good benefits for the patient, so there's no real advantage to going to the patch. So a lot of APIs 
are positive, but for other reasons, not selected to be delivered. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you for that, Marco. Okay. (laughs) No worries. So um, one person's curious asking, can you provide an overview of the development timescales or timelines? Uh, Not here today. Uh, Of course I can. So if you're interested, contact us. We have certain, I would say, standard plans where we say this is the approach for a new development or generic development or next generation. But there are some different implications mm-hmm. on what's needed in the early time front or later stages. So we're happy to share these insights within within deeper discussions in a one-to-one situation, but I'm not willing to I can't share this information within the webinar. Sorry. No problem. Understood. All right, let's go into some questions on the marketplace. So, um, Dr. Marco, do you see any growth in the transdermal market? Maybe that's a question for May to be answered. Yeah, no, I can take that. Um, (laughs) Yeah, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, So some may be aware that transdermal sales have been pretty steady or stagnant in recent years, and much of that is due to the entry of generic products. Um, So sales have decreased accordingly. Um, But in the past couple of years, in 2020 and 2021, we've seen um, approvals of new active substances in the area of transdermals after it's been a while and um, also additional products in the approval phase. So, you know, like I said at the beginning, I, I do think there is some growth in the transdermal market that will be seen in the next, in the years to come. Mm-hmm. Sure. Thank you for that, Dr. May. I guess that also answers um, where do you see the transdermal market going, unless you have anything further to add on to that. Anything further to add on? Um, you know, yeah. So I think it goes along the same lines as far as, uh, you know, CNS, as we have seen, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, there are, uh, that's a pretty strong area for transdermals. But um, there have been new products um, in the field of antipsychotics and contraception and migraine. Mm-hmm. Um, for transdermals. So, uh, yeah, I mean, using, if, if someone has an idea, contact us. Um, we can try to put uh, the API through the trace um, tool and see if it makes sense to pursue. Um, so, yeah, I think the transdermal market is going to other disease indications beyond CNS. Great. Thank you for that, Dr. May. So between you two, how long does it take to run these trace simulations? So the first, um, the trace scoring, actually it's a matter of days or maybe one, two weeks to select all the literature data in case everything can be found in literature. Of course, the the data set doesn't need to be complete. We can already do a scoring with a, a reasonable number of parameters. Um, so this can be done within a short period of time. Um, the trace IVM simulation uh, is basically determined by h- how fast can we get these data which we have to feed into the system. Uh, the actual simulation is done you know, maybe within a few hours. Uh, the, the key, the most work is to, to get all the data in the, in the, in the software. So um, it's really driven by the availability of, of available data to get this analysis done. Yeah. Great, great. So is this simulation software freely available? No, that's uh, the software is proprietary to LTS. So that's our internal development, uh, both of them. And uh, we actually, we are already in uh, further development for the trace tools to get an next generation out of this. Uh, so you, you can't buy it. You can only come to LTS and, and use it with us in a certain way. But the scoring is something we do very happily before approaching us or when approaching us with all sorts of ideas uh, before actually going into a feasibility projects. We are providing this, this trace scoring. So that's something which you simply contact me or me and we can do that. Sure. So are there any new formulation technologies for, in this case, passive transdermal delivery? And that's a good question. And, and um, to, to, to be honest, yes, there are a number of new concepts which are out there. 
uh, for example, um, something like ionic liquid formulations, so co co solvents, co formers, which can be used to increase the permeability through the skin layer. The similar concepts have been developed and used for all sorts of companies in that in that area, and I think that's that's uh, these are pretty good concepts to to increase um, certain API solubilities and also at the same time reduce patch sizes. So I think there's some some opportunity. It has nothing to do with additional functional excipients uh, like adhesives or so. It's mainly on the way we handle the API and how we make it more permeable at the end of the day. So I think that's something we have seen without going into too much details. Sure, sure. Understood, Dr. Marco. So um, ensuring API is not a skin sensitizer, is it perhaps more important than trace? Uh, it's, it's important and actually also this is part of trace. So when we find um, literature data on in this case uh, to see whether we can expect some um, sensitization, skin irritation, etc. This is where we are raising a flag or even setting up a not quite criteria. So of course, this is one of the key components and not just that the, the technical feasibility whether it goes to the skin, but also what it does with the skin is, is of importance. And uh, if the literature data set is not sufficient. That's also something we are checking within the development. If this is not available as a data, um, we are checking that either in vitro, but also within the animal studies, whether we can we can identify and skin irritation or sensitization as well. So that's, as I would say, of same importance, because if it's not going through the skin anyway, then it doesn't make sense to develop it as well. Sure. Thank you for that, Dr. Marco. Um, so one person asked in relation to the case study two example that you showed during the presentation, would the use of dissolution profile to screen formulations with an absorption enhancer be meaningful to correlate to the human skin permeation data? That's a, that's already a good detailed question. I mean, this is, when you go into formulation level, both uh, by based on both data sets, you are um, you're determining certain uh, diffusion coefficients, and uh, uh, all sorts of components within the formulation have an impact on these diffusion parameters or these permeation coefficients. So, of course, also a um, permeation enhancer, which mostly is also solubilizer for an API, has an impact also in the solution because. It, it differs whether it's, sort of, um, it's, it's supporting the API to diffuse out of the, the patch or not. So you have to do both at the end of the day to make the right choice. You can't rely just on the solution profile or on the permeation data, I think. Um, but there are also limitations because some, um, I would say some generic patch formulations maybe in the market do not show good uh, similar dissolution profiles since the methods which have been used to development at them are completely different. So we want to have to design a new this data set uh, then compared to those which are public by, for example, the FDA method, uh, methods and um, yeah, to, to make the right correlation. But that's something which is really for the experts who also created this software. And if there's interest in to have a deeper dive we might have a follow-up discussion on this. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Dr. May, do you have anything else to also add on before we conclude today? No, I just want to thank you, Peter, for hosting us. Um, Marco, great presentation. Please don't hesitate, uh, the audience, to contact us if you have more questions and are interested in um, seeing if your API of interest could potentially be uh, delivered via um, a transdermal patch. Great. Thank you very much for that, Dr. May. And thank you very much to the audience. Just a quick reminder, if you did not get your question answered, they could be answered at a later date. So that just leaves me to thank both Dr. Marco M. Gimblosh and Dr. May Pidion for a great presentation and to LTS AG for sponsoring this event. Now to all the attendees, you will receive an email shortly on how you can access the on-demand version. 
or you can access it on our website, www.business-review-webinars.com. We look forward to sharing future webinars with you, so please to keep an eye out on our website, as mentioned, and follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates and join our LinkedIn community group. Once again, thank you all very much for attending today's session with the LTS AG, and I hope you all have a very pleasant day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.